Welcome to Starve the Doubts. This is your host, Jared Easley. We are fortunate today to have John Dumas on the show. Now, I first heard about John the end of 2012, and he had a lot of buzz going on. He was interviewing a lot of A-list people, and he was coming out with a podcast every single day. And I thought, how is that possible? How does this guy have time to put out a podcast every day? How in the world is he getting big names like Seth Godin, Tim Ferriss, Gary Vaynerchuk, Guy Kawasaki, Barbara Corcoran from Shark Tank? The list goes on. He was killing it. How in the world did he do this? And I personally made a mission to meet John Dumas at New Media Expo this last January. And I had a chance to pick his brain a little bit. And I'll share some of that later. But John is a class guy. He's extremely smart. He's doing it the right way. He's got workflows and processes in place to help him get this stuff done. And in eight months, he's gone from almost nobody knowing who he is to being all over the place and on top, basically, of the podcast world in, in terms of the business section. Entrepreneur on Fire. He's also doing so many other cool things, like the podcast launch book that he came out with on Kindle. And he's got a unique strategy with the way he releases other follow-up podcasts. I, I just really like what this guy's doing, and I'm excited to share that with you today. So we'll go into the John Dumas interview, and then we'll do a wrap-up at the end. John Dumas is the man behind the popular podcast, Entrepreneur on Fire. He has over 100,000 downloads Every month. Well, I'm sure it's way more than that now. What is it, John? Uh, we're over 150,000 now, John. <laughs> over 150,000 downloads every month for your show. <laughs> and the mission of Entrepreneur on Fire is to inspire millions. You're, you're already getting there. John is doing that through interviewing highly successful entrepreneurs on his show. And he's providing a podcast platform service for aspiring entrepreneurs who want a podcast. And he's also the author of a new book on podcasting that's available on Kindle. Welcome to the show, John. Jared, it is great to be here. Thanks for having me on. And, and John, i got to say it, just because I am a part of Fire Nation, are you ready to ignite? I am prepared to ignite, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always like to ignite with a question that is not so much business to kick off. Let's just find a little bit more about you. What's the best concert that you have ever been to? Well, I do love concerts. I don't get to nearly as many as I would like to, but... One of my favorite bands growing up and remains to this day is U2. And back in 2001, I was a senior in college down in Providence, Rhode Island, and we had tickets to the Halloween 2001 uh, U2 tour. And as we all know, 2001 happened, and especially for me being an ROTC cadet, we knew that that was some pretty serious business, and we didn't know if the concert was still going to happen because it was pretty close to New York City where we were located at. Mm -hmm. Long story short, they pushed forward with the concert. It was unbelievably emotional. They actually projected the names of every one of the victims across the entire Civic Center in tribute. And it was special because it was U2, but it was even more special because you could just feel the entire Civic Center coming together as one country. So it was an amazing concert, and U2 has always been high on my list. But after that, they just take the cake. Did they play the song one? They did play the song one, and I think you know, I think that's actually the song that they played while they were projecting the names of the victims. Wow, what's your favorite U two song? Um, With or without you was really the song that brought me to U two, so it's kind of my favorite for those reasons. Did I disappoint you? Or leave a bad taste in your uh, mouth. Let's talk a little bit about some of your travels. You've been all over the country. You've been from the West Coast all the way to Maine and everywhere in between. And I'm curious, that's a lot of cuisine. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite food, John? I'm always changing. I do believe the variety is the spice of life. And I recently read Rich Roll's Finding Ultra, and I was able to convince my girlfriend to go to a plant-powered diet for a little while afterwards, and I really fell in love with sweet potatoes. I feel like if you can have sweet potatoes with any bland food, it really just adds it to the mix. So that's what I'm going to go with today, Jared. <laughs> I'm going to have sweet potatoes with my cereal. <laughs> 
right. All right. Let's go into – I'm going to give you two options, and you just tell me which option you prefer and maybe why you prefer it. Let's start with water skiing versus snow skiing. <laughs> Well, I do love both. I grew up on a lake in Maine, so I grew up water skiing. And, and one of those many places that you mentioned that I actually lived and was I was stationed in Fort Riley, Kansas, which afforded me the opportunity to be on the Kansas State water ski team as a graduate student. So I'm a huge water ski fan. That being said, snow skiing will always take the cake there. Just got back from a five-day trip to Vail, Breckenridge, and Keystone, where I was skiing some waist-deep powder. and I just can't get enough of the adventure that snow skiing has. Are you a black diamond kind of guy? I'm a double black diamond kind of guy. Oh, <laughs> fair enough. All right. Speaking of workouts, P90X versus Insanity. Well, I've done both so many times I can't even count. I definitely started with P90X, but at this point, I'm more of a fan of Insanity because you get your cardio workout in and you also get some good strength training as well. So it's more of an overall workout in my mind. So Insanity. Yeah, Sean T's not messing around. Sean T. Two, three, two, spin it up, go. You've been in a lot of places. We mentioned that. And here's a few cities, and I'm wondering which is your favorite. San Diego, Boston, and New York City. Love them all. Lived in every one of them. Um, I'll go in reverse order. Boston is a great city, has a lot of colleges, a lot of great sports teams, all of which I grew up rooting for. So that is a phenomenal city, but I will have to put that third on the list because New York City at number two just has 24-7 vibrancy and life and so much action. I was just there this past weekend for St. Paddy's Day, and the St. Paddy's Day parade was so much fun. But San Diego has to be my number one. It's just perfect in pretty much every way imaginable. And <laughs> I'm going to be a full-time San Diegan as of June 1st. So a lot of good things going on there. Congratulations. Thank you. Army versus Navy. <sighs> I'd be curious how most people answer this question that you interview or if this is a question specific to me because... Oh, very specific oh, okay, to you. Okay, okay. I don't know if you were just going to ask every one of your guests this question because I would be interested in what the poll would be. Um, for me, though, it's a pretty much a slam dunk. I was in ROTC in college and was an Army officer for four years, act, four years active, four years in the reserve, so Army all the way. Yeah, I, I know, obviously, that you were in the Army, but just in case anyone out there didn't know, <laughs> <laughs> now they can sleep easy at night. Although, when I was deployed in, in, in Iraq for 13 months, believe it or not, we really started utilizing what they call CBs, who are the soldiers of the Navy. They would actually come inland and would go on missions with us. So, I have the utmost respect for the Navy, not as just those people that float in the ocean, but for the people that have feet on the ground. You also get to enjoy a lot of hang time with a few sailors when you're in San Diego. <laughs> Probably more than I'd like to be honest. <laughs> There's one or two. <laughs> Let's fill in the blank. I'm going to give you the beginning of a sentence. You just complete it. And the sentence is, if you ever visit Maine, climb Mount Katahdin in Baxter State Park, you will definitely see a moose. <laughs> definitely see a moose. Is there an ideal time of year to do that? The fall. The, the leaves that change in Maine are incredibly beautiful. And so if you do the late September into October, early November time frame, bring a jacket. It'll be brisk, but it'll be beautiful. Speaking of incredible and things that I think are beautiful is your list of guests <laughs> that you've interviewed on Entrepreneur on Fire. Thank Very you. impressive. I'm curious, do you have one interview or do you have an ultimate guest out of everyone you've interviewed so far? I love them all. They're, they're all great for different reasons. But Barbara Corcoran was really one that I look back at and was just a really fun time. I mean, she has so much visibility with the public with Shark Tank. So that was one reason that I just really enjoyed having her on. But she's just a really fun, cool person. And she pretty much flirted with flirted with me the entire interview and that was pretty interesting i can testify to that i've heard that interview <laughs> and and she did <laughs> december 28th that's when the interview went live check it out 
that was a very good interview. And she also shared a lot about her story of how she got started, which I was really enjoyed seeing that and hearing that side of her. Yeah, it was fascinating. Let, let's list a few of the guests that you've had on your show. And if you'd be willing, just maybe share one thing that you've either learned or just something that you admire about this person. And let's start with Barbara Corcoran. Well, as you said, she did share her story. And one thing that I drew out of that was persistency and her tenacity will always win out. I mean, she went up against it many times, was knocked down many times, but she's like, I don't want to say cougar because that might give the wrong connotation, but <laughs> she keeps coming back, and that's so important as an entrepreneur. Gary Vaynerchuk. Gary, he just has an idea, and he goes for it. He's always way ahead of the curve, but he doesn't let people say, like, you're crazy, or he lets them say it, but he just ignores them, and that's so important as an entrepreneur, and I kind of was able to relate that to me with Entrepreneur on Fire. Everybody was saying, John, you're crazy. One podcast every single day? Like, you can't do it. I had to just kind of drown out that noise and go forward because I knew that I could, and Gary had the same kind of relationship with Wine Library and things that he's done along the way. Let's just stop there for a second, and you mentioned you had a lot of people saying, oh, that's an extremely daunting task that you're going to do, and you're likely to fail by doing a podcast every day. You now have been doing this for over, what, 150 episodes now? Yeah, I have over 200 completed. Wow. And I know you have some, some mentors who you probably are sending them all the, the fan emails that say, thank you so much for doing this every day. <laughs> no, absolutely. And, you know, that was one of their things. I mean, it came from a good place. My mentors, when they were, you know, talking to me about the situation and they were worried that I would burn out. And that's always a possibility. That's one thing that entrepreneurs do need to keep in mind. But in, I know we'll probably be talking about this later, but I do have a very regimented schedule that I I believe is the reason why I have not yet and will not burn out because it's very important. But yeah, specifically, I got nothing but love for Cliff Ravenscraft. I'm in his podcast mastermind, but he was definitely one of the people that said, John, anything more than one a week is way too much. So I've definitely forwarded him a few emails from people who have said, John, if you stop doing your daily interviews, I don't know what I would do because <laughs> I could not survive commuting to work without you now. On the road again. Just can't wait to get on the road again. And you've done really challenging things like uh, tours overseas in the Army. I mean, a daily podcast, that seems like nothing, I would imagine. It, comparatively, it truly is. I mean, 13 months in Iraq, I was in Fallujah, Aramadi, Habania. That's a seven-day-a-week. You are 12 to 16 hours a day. You need to be on alert. You need to be focused. And, you know, doing a eight, you know, seven or eight podcast interviews a week kind of pales in comparison. So that experience definitely prepared you for what you're doing now. No doubt about it, Jared. Seth Godin. Seth is constantly pushing the envelope with his thoughts and ideas. I am a daily reader of his blog because just like you know, I knew that I really could reach an audience with a daily podcast, he knows that he can reach a massive audience with a, a very small snippet but very powerful words. And so he's, he's done that. He has a huge subscriber list. And I, I keep reading because he keeps pushing the envelope with his thoughts and ideas. Do you have a favorite book by Seth Godin? You know, The Icarus Deception, his latest book that just came out, I thought was mm -hmm. phenomenal. I actually got it as an audio book and listened to it, and he's the narrator as well. And I think that that book is great. And I think that his books just keep getting better in a lot of ways because he is such a person who – takes his experience in life and passes it along. And he's just getting more and more experience as the years go by. You mentioned audiobooks. I've noticed that you are actually doing something really generous for your listeners. You're giving them through Audible a, a way to get a free audiobook. Would you mind mentioning that real quick? Yeah, yeah. Audible.com actually reached out to me and said, John, we know you have a very passionate and engaged list that we resonate very well with. We'd like to offer your listeners a free audiobook if they subscribe. Um, through your link. And so that's eofirebook.com. And for anybody out there that just loves to listen to great content, you can get a free audiobook. You can kickstart a free 30 day membership, and it's a great program. 
Definitely. Was Seth Godin difficult to book for your show? He was surprisingly difficult and easy at the same time. He's the kind of person Mm -hmm. that he will literally respond to your email. Like if you emailed him tomorrow, Jared, he'll respond back. It'll be all lowercase. It'll probably be a very to the point answer because he's a busy guy. He needs to be direct and to the point. And I, I really personally appreciate that. And everybody that hears back from him should as well. Um, but you know, I, I reached out to him a couple of times and he was just like, uh, oh, really busy right now, John, really busy and kind of just setting these pings back. But I was persistent and I had some tenacity just like Barbara Corcoran and I hit him on the right day and he literally responded and said, how about tomorrow, 2 PM? And I said, let's do it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Another awesome name that you've interviewed is Guy Kawasaki. Oh, that guy is just so much fun. And that's kind of what I would say about him is that you can really be fun and be successful, too. He's just like a young Santa Claus. He loves to laugh. He loves to joke around. And he's just a genuinely good guy. Chris Brogan. Oh, quick wit and humor. I mean, those are really two ingredients to success in the online world because people love to laugh. And Chris is legitimately a hysterically funny guy. And he does it in a very dry and sometimes sarcastic way, which just hits hits my funny bone every time. So I love listening to his stuff because of that. And he has a great podcast going himself, which mm-hmm. I was honored to be a guest on recently. Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss. Now, this guy, anybody who's read the four-hour work week, you will know straight off the bat that this is a person that thinks outside the box. Mm-hmm. I just cannot love that story enough where he tells the fact that he entered that like taekwondo nat world championship and he had found some kind of loophole in the rules that just allowed him to basically walk over to these like four foot ten incredibly skilled taekwondo people or whatever the actual fight was and pick them up and throw them out of the ring and, and become the <laughs> champion and, that, and i mean obviously he made incredible amounts of enemies but he was just proving a point that you can literally be the world champion in something you have zero skills in if you find the loophole. And in a lot of ways, Jared, I feel like I found a loophole with podcasting. I mean, I'm getting over 150,000 unique downloads every month, and it's growing every single day because in a way I feel like I found that niche that people were were waiting for and it hadn't been filled yet because just like Tim Ferriss wasn't good at Taekwondo, I was definitely not good at podcasting when I started, but... You do anything enough like the Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hour tipping point. I mean, you're going to you're going to improve. You have improved. And I thought your initial interviews were fantastic. But now you're only getting better. And and I think, wow, what (laughs) the sky's the limit literally (laughs) for John Dumas. Thank you. I really do appreciate that. (laughs) And also, I think you found the loophole with the quick action to release a Kindle book. We're going to talk about that later in the interview, but I'm just so impressed with uh, how you were able to get that out there. That's cool. amazing. I'd love to share. But let's talk about Pat Flynn. Pat Flynn, this guy just provides as much value as is physically possible, and then he literally will just provide more value. And you'll be like, how does this guy just keep providing so much value? Like, it's incredible what he does and the connection that you feel like you make with him so quickly. So, yeah, all value. Yeah, he always is. He makes you feel like you know him. Yeah. <laughs> Even if you do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, Dan Miller. Uh, Dan has just proved to me that you can literally build a business around genuine, genuine kindness and actually caring. I mean, this is a guy that when he finds somebody that he connects with, he really gets out there and strives to make a friendship. And I've been fortunate enough to be one of those people. And I just love what he does. You are providing a lot of value through a lot of different ways, like public speaking. I know you're a social media strategist, obviously. You're a podcaster and now an author. What do you want to be known for? That's a good question, Jared, because I have this great logo for Entrepreneur on Fire, but I knew it was missing something. I knew it was missing a tagline of some sort. And I was really struggling for a couple of weeks to come up with what I thought was the right one that was short, that was to the point. And finally, my girlfriend, Kate, just said, inspiring millions. And to me, that just really hit every note of what I was really trying to embody with with Entrepreneur on Fire. So 
to answer your question, I have to say that a podcaster that inspires millions, because that's literally what my goal is every single time I interview an entrepreneur. And when I open up my download stats and I see that not only is Entrepreneur on Fire being downloaded at such a high clip, but in over 140 countries around the world, that to me is really powerful. Well, I'm one of the millions, definitely. <laughs> and Thank you. you. You also have in your podcast intro, you say that you know you want to share the success stories of others to illuminate you know the path for entrepreneurs who are wanting to get started. And and I feel like on many levels, you've illuminated the path for for people like me. Definitely, John. Thank you for that. My pleasure. And it really means a lot that you would say that. You always ask your guests to share their aha moment. I'm wondering, would you be willing to share your uh uh-oh moment? (laughs) You know, I like this question. I might have to start asking my guests this every now and then (laughs) because I think it is interesting. I will say I've been fortunate on a lot of levels to not have that many uh uh-oh moments. I've definitely had my uh aha moments and my setbacks on both sides of it. I would have to say, though, a recent uh uh-oh moment that I've had, I've literally recently received correspondence from Entrepreneur Magazine's legal department to cease and desist using the word entrepreneur and entrepreneur on fire. Really? That's a little bit of an uh uh-oh moment. I I can't say I'm going to roll over like a dog. I'm fortunate to come from a family of lawyers, and my father is going to tackle this situation head on because you can't own the word entrepreneur. But when you receive a packet in the mail, and then it goes to your parents' house, and then it goes to your mailbox that you have for your business address, and it's very legalese, and it's very... It's full of a lot of uh, very serious language, so to speak. Mm-hmm. It's a it's a little bit of an of an uh-oh, of an uh oh moment, and you gotta really take a step back and see where your focuses lie. So, I'm looking to tackle this head on and see what happens. But uh, yeah, that's a little bit of an uh oh. I appreciate your transparency in sharing that. Definitely, I I agree with you. I don't know how that will will play out, but it's nice to know that you have good people in your corner to to help you look through that. Well, it's also interesting that. You literally, I was literally picturing this boardroom at Entrepreneur Magazine having my logo up with all their board members sitting around and being like, who is this guy that is podcasting (laughs) using Entrepreneur on Fire? We need to go after him. And to me, you know, it's it's a little interesting and a little flattering on some levels that they're taking notice of my podcast, but unfortunately it's in this kind of light. And it's also unfortunate in my mind that, Literally, a magazine that supposedly is dedicating themselves to furthering entrepreneurs is trying to come down on this obvious entrepreneur enterprise that is only looking to inspire people and offering it free. Yep, that's true. And, oh man, yeah. No, you, we could have a whole other podcast about this. <laughs> well, in a way, it, like you mentioned, it is flattering, and it's it's almost like a great problem to have. But, yeah, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. I'll definitely want to follow up with you on that one. Yeah. You mentioned earlier you have some systems in place, and your systems empower you to do what you do, and that's a podcast every weekday. And then you do shows on the weekend, too. How do you manage to get so much done with your systems? Well, one thing that I did take away from the Army, a, a saying that you, you see in a lot of commercials that have come out recently, and it's something that we've always said, is that we get more done before 9 a.m. than the rest of the world does all day. And mm-hmm. I love that quote because a lot of times I can verify that it was true. I mean, the amount of stuff that we would do in the wee hours of the morning, you know, protecting this country, were extremely intense, crazy, and just overall consuming. But I was really able to take that and apply it to Entrepreneur on Fire. You know, I'm not the earliest of early risers, but I do get up and I'm immediately at my desk working. Um, I like to be working by 7 a.m. every morning. And those first two hours between 7 to 9, I get a lot of stuff done. And it really sets up the rest of my day for success. But to note specifically for Entrepreneur on Fire and people that just say, wow, it's insane that you're literally doing one interview every single day. What it really comes down to is that I'm doing usually between eight to 10 interviews every Monday. And Mm -hmm. believe me, Jared, that's a very long day. And I don't 
really look forward to it. I do enjoy it on a lot of levels because I'm talking to really amazing entrepreneurs the entire day, but it is very taxing and it's very draining on a lot of levels too. However, I focus. I Every Monday, I do eight interviews, sometimes 10. The day is over. I do all the editing on Tuesday. And then I literally have the rest of the week ahead of me to do everything else it takes to continue to further the brand of Entrepreneur on Fire. So one incredibly long day of interviews gives me six days of pretty much freedom. Well, I mean, freedom, you're you're also marketing and and writing books and (laughs) you're doing a lot of stuff. This is no four-hour work week. And (laughs) the word freedom denotes freedom to continue to bust my hump on Entrepreneur on Fire, all the social media, the platform, writing books, creating products and services, everything else that goes into running a business. Well, and you're passionate about it, so that I'm sure makes it easier. Much easier. Much, much easier. And now that I know that about you, you always have such energy in every episode. That's incredible. How do you bring that energy for every one of those calls on a Monday? Well, I really respect the fact that people are taking the time out of their day to come on Entrepreneur on Fire and share their journey. And I really want to honor that by bringing them the enthusiasm and passion that I feel like their journey deserves. So I always am able to kind of hype myself up before each interview with that knowledge. And I I have done a handful of interviews standing up, which I really do enjoy. I'm not currently doing that right now, and I don't do it for most of my Entrepreneur um, on Fire episodes either. But I do think that I will be getting a standing desk at some point shortly because I really do believe in the motion creates a motion effect and standing up can be pretty powerful. But at the same time, as you know, Jared, it can be kind of difficult because it's really important with these you know, nice dynamic microphones that we have to speak straight into it. And you definitely have a tendency to sway and to kind of lose your point of reference when you're standing. John, I'm going to stand up to ask this next question. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I feel energized. You do something that not a lot of podcasters do, and I think that's to your advantage. You post your podcast to YouTube, but what's the thought behind that? It really just goes to the Pat Flynn Be Everywhere strategy. There's no Mm -hmm. reason for me not to repurpose my content that's on iTunes to YouTube as well. It's just going to reach a larger demographic, a larger audience. It's not that much work for me. I just literally take um, the audio from my MP3 that I've had the interview, drop it into ScreenFlow, take a screenshot of that person's About Me page, and just run the episode and then upload it to YouTube. And that brings in hundreds of views every single day. People who I'm sure have are finding out about Entrepreneur on Fire because of that. So it's just really because of that Be Everywhere strategy. You mentioned how you repurposed your content, and I would say that's a nice segue to the Kindle book because your Kindle book is your story, and then it's some how-to tutorials on on essential things that people need to know about podcasting to get launched and started. All of that is extremely cool, but I know that stuff that you've talked about and you've worked on for all of these months – and now you've packaged it into a Kindle book. Tell me, tell me about that process of why the Kindle book, why you wanted to go in that direction, how that came together, so on and so forth. I definitely never started Entrepreneur on Fire thinking that I was going to be writing a book about podcasting. I really thought it would be more creating products and services for entrepreneurs that are just starting their leap. But – As you know, Jared, sometimes life can just take different twists and turns and you need to always have your ears open and listen to your audience. And for months and months and months, I just had so many people emailing me and saying, John, I really love your podcast. How do you do it? Can you give me some more technical information? Because I want to do something similar in my own niche, in my own industry. And I would always point people to Cliff Ravenscraft, the podcast answer man, because he has phenomenal tools and tricks and he really covers it all but a large number of people kept coming back and saying no john that's great but i want to know how you do it you're the entrepreneur that i listen to every single day you're the person that i want to learn from so to speak so i really took that 
And I decided, you know, actually, I do do this as a profession. I do have a lot to share. I'm yes. working in this business every single day, six days a week, seven days a week. It's literally all I do with my passion, and I would love to pass that along. So I sat down. I shared my entire story about Entrepreneur on Fire and how I created the podcast itself. And I really get technical about all the different ways to produce a podcast, but then I end the book with a couple really cool chapters about how to grow your audience as a podcaster, how to monetize if you ever want to go down that road. But the things that I'm really most proud of and passionate about are the 15 video tutorials that I just include for free with the book. I mean, like all ego aside, I truly do believe that those um, video tutorials could be packaged into a product and sold for hundreds of dollars. But that wasn't my goal with the Entrepreneur on Fire book podcast launch. I really just wanted to get out there in the Amazon marketplace, another one of those be everywhere strategies and, and just provide incredible value like I've learned from Pat Flynn, like I've learned from Dan Miller and kind of be looked at as the go to source for that. And so the book went live, a, you know, a handful of weeks ago, Jared already has over 51 five star reviews, which is incredibly high for an, just an, a straight camp, Amazon Kindle book. So I'm very proud of that fact. Sure. And. I, I was really surprised at the lack of books on podcasting in Amazon. And, you know, I'm proud to say that it is a, officially the number one book in the Amazon store on podcasting. And I am very proud of that, too, because I do know that it does provide just incredible value for anybody that wants to learn more about this industry. It is a good book. I have actually gone through it. And, yeah, I'm a fan, definitely. Thank you. I even am one of those 51 reviews. You are <laughs> not only are you one of the 51, you are the one and only and this is very powerful video review which was awesome. So I really appreciate you taking the time to do that, Jared. Differentiate or die, John. Yeah, well you did. <laughs> uh, for people who'd be interested in creating their own Kindle book, is that a difficult process? It's such an easy process, Jared. It really is. I was clueless going into it. I didn't even know if I was able to type it on Word or whatever, but I'm telling you, it could not be easier. Just to really give you know your listeners a quick summation, you literally just type out a book on, on Word, on any kind of document that you want to. You find a formatter online. I found one um, for $25. He took that document. He formatted it into what's called the .mobi format, which is what Kindle needs. Mm -hmm. And that was it. Then you literally take that format, you go to the Kindle store, and you go through their process of submitting, of just kind of checking the right boxes and pasting or uploading that actual MOBI document. And within 48 hours, it's live. Now, you obviously need to take one more step that I didn't mention at the beginning, but that is get a cover as well. And again, that's an extremely simple process. You can do that for $5 on Fiverr.com, and that quickly you can have a book up in the Amazon store. I loved your strategy, too. Not only did you have a book, but you said, hey, here's the free audio book, and not to mention all the tutorials that you said are hundreds of dollars in value. You packed it all into the Kindle book. I packed it all in, and I'll tell you, I had a lot of great advice for some, from some other entrepreneurs who have gone down this road. There's this whole Kindle launch book strategy I was not aware of. I was clueless of. But, I mean, one of those is exactly that. Like, if you, if you think about it, Jared, when you go to a book on Amazon, you can click the click to open button, and you can read the first couple pages of any book in the Kindle store. Mm -hmm. And so this entrepreneur recommended to me, hey, within that first couple pages, you know, people that may not want to buy the book because they don't want to spend the $5, um, Offer them something so you you know to so they can join your email list so they can become part of Fire Nation still. So I just sat down, I did an audio version of the book, and I within the first page I actually said, hey, if you want the audio version for free of this book, click here. It takes them to an, uh, an opt-in form where they s submit their name and email address, and then boom, the actual audio version gets shot over to them, and they wow. listen to the book in its entirety. And if they choose to later come back and 
purchase the book, that's great. If they don't, that's great. But they're officially now part of the Entrepreneur on Fire brand. They get to hear my voice, my passion, and many of them probably become Entrepreneur on Fire listeners, which is the overall goal. That is a great goal. Well played there. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> I should write a book on Kindle launch now. <laughs> not a bad not a bad thing. I'm going to get it when you do. Speaking of your books for Kindle, I when I look at Kindle books, I noticed a lot of different prices. Like one could be 99 cents and 4.99 and 7.99. What advice do you offer for setting a price for someone who releases a Kindle book? That's another great question and another part of the Kindle launch strategy that I utilize. Pretty much the lowest that you can offer your book for is 99 cents. Kindle does not, or Amazon does not allow you to go any lower. So I started my book at 99 cents just to really, um, one, get it out there and get a bunch of sales in, out there so you can climb up the Amazon rankings. But number two, I gifted over 150 books to my email list. I sent out an email to um, Fire Nation subscribers and I said, hey, if anybody wants a, this Kindle book for free, shoot me back an email. I will make it happen. So I got over 150 emails. I, e I gifted um, at the cost to me of, of over $150 um, the Kindle book to each and every one of them and kindly asked, if you do enjoy, I would love a review. And many of them, as you did, acquiesced. And then after that little phase went through, I did raise it to four ninety nine. And there's a couple reasons for that. Ninety nine cents, you know, is a perceived value, and perception is reality. So, a lot of times people will look at a book and say, "How good can it possibly be?" It's only ninety nine cents. So, I didn't create podcast launch to make money. I did it to increase my brand. So, I would have loved to keep it at ninety nine cents if it would mean more sales. But again, I'm looking to promote the book as a very valuable resource and just we don't have really high perceived value of 99 cent books. And then as far, I think 499 is really a sweet spot for a lot of books. And this is even advice from Seth Godin, who is one of the publishing mavericks. Mm. Um, the only time that I've heard is a good way for an unknown author like myself to go to 799 is right before you go down to what's called your free days. Cause on Kindle, you enter the select program, which I have, you get five days to give away your book for free. And that can be really powerful, believe it or not, because it really can get the book in a lot of hands of people, especially when you have my mindset of I'm just trying to spread the word of entrepreneur on fire. I'm just trying to get it out to as many people as possible. And you shoot up the ladders of the rankings because your book is being given away, but, but Amazon counts it as sales. So it's really powerful for your rankings. And there's a ton of websites out there that promote free books. And you can reach out and contact these websites and they'll promote your book for free. And there's hundreds of thousands of people that go to these websites every day just looking for free Kindle books. It's a whole mm -hmm. underground society. It's very fascinating. And so if you <laughs> bump your book up, to, long story short, if you bump your book up to seven ninety nine, and then you have your free day the day later – that little price that is scratched out will say seven ninety nine. Now it's free, and people will be like, "Whoa, this book was seven ninety nine. Now it's free. I get to jump on mm. it." Instead of being like, "Oh, well, the book was only ninety nine cents. If I don't get it now, I can just get it later for a buck." Absolutely, <laughs> John. Your goal is to inspire millions. Who inspires you? You know, this is such almost a stock answer because this is such an <laughs> this is such an entrepreneur magnet, but it is just true. I gotta I gotta be honest with my answer. Richard Branson inspires me. And the reason why he inspires me is for a very specific reason. He makes it look so easy. He just is this cavalier, suave guy that's out there floating around. Everything he touches seems to turn to gold. Now the crazy thing is is that behind the scenes, he is an incredibly hard working, driven guy. But he's able to have this just this great front of calmness and austere. And that is one reason why he inspires me, because he makes it look easy, even though it's not. John, we'll wrap this up. What, what's the best place for people to connect with you online? 
my headquarters, entrepreneuronfire.com, is the best place to, to find me. I have a great uh, free book for anybody that subscribes to Fire Nation. It's the top 10 insights from 10 incredible entrepreneurs, many of the people that we've talked about today. Mm-hmm. They're best insights from the show. So that is definitely the headquarters. And obviously, I'd love if you searched Entrepreneur on Fire on iTunes and subscribed. And you're also on social media. All over social media. I mean, <laughs> you, you got it. I have some very passionate virtual assistants that make sure that I am very active on there. Well done. John, I really appreciate your time. And, wow, great info, great insight. And, wow, <laughs> thank you so much. Jared, I hope I provide value. Thank you truly for having me on as a guest. I really enjoyed it. Did you enjoy the interview with John Dumas? If so, would you consider sending him a message? One of the best ways to do that is through Twitter. You can tweet to him at John Lee Dumas, J-O-H-N-L-E-E-D-U-M-A-S, at John Lee Dumas. I want to give a quick shout-out to Hutch, Money Plan, SOS, Stephen Reichwalder, and Thomas Ostas. They made the time out of their day to go and leave a rating and a review in iTunes, and this really helps the show to gain visibility in iTunes new and noteworthy. Would you be willing to consider, if you enjoyed the show, going into iTunes and leaving a review and comment? It really does help, and it is greatly appreciated. Next up, on the podcast, I am super humbled to announce that my guest will be Michael Hyatt, the Michael Hyatt, New York Times bestselling author, Michael Hyatt, platform book, Michael Hyatt. <laughs> All I can say is this is a star of the doubts moment. I didn't think I'd be able to ever get access to Michael or it would take a very long time to get access to Michael. And I asked. I asked one time and I was told, you know, right now Michael doesn't do interviews unless it's extremely mutually beneficial. And I thought, okay, no problem. I'll get him next time. Well, at the SCORE conference in Orlando, Michael Hyatt was there. And I asked again, is there any way I can get just a few minutes with Michael? And turns out it worked out. So I think that's a really encouraging lesson to any of you new podcasters out there. If you want to interview someone who's an A-lister, so to speak, go where they are, see if you can connect with them at a conference or at an event, and see if you can just grab an interview right then. It may or may not happen, but it's definitely worth a shot. Michael was extremely professional and very cool to take a few minutes and sit with me and do the interview, and I'm excited to share that with you and additional conversations from the SCORE conference this past week in Orlando. That'll be on the next episode. In the meantime, always treat others the way that they want to be treated, Always do your best, and remember to starve the doubts. Okay, for sticking around, I'll hook you up. This is a recorded conversation between John Dumas, Chris Murphy, Shea Harms, and myself at In-N-Out Burger in Las Vegas this past January at New Media Expo. There's a lot of crowd noise in the background, but you should be able to make out the conversation. I hope that you enjoy it. John tells a little bit of his backstory, so I enjoyed it. Thanks. I was struggling, you know, I was, back when I was first starting, I was like, what can I do? I knew I wanted it to be about entrepreneur, but that's such a tough word to spell. Yeah. Nobody can spell, I can't spell entrepreneur still. I have it like as my little text spam, really, automatic. No, it's true. It's, it's a long, long word to spell. It's a long yes. word. Yeah. On, uh, obviously, I don't know how many, I'm like a huge fan of Bachelor. On the Bachelor, pad was, they had a spelling bee, and one of the last words that they had hilarious. spelling bee was entrepreneur. That's hilarious. Like so hard My degree was entrepreneurship at Wichita State, where I actually graduated. So I've practiced that for 20 years now. <laughs> <laughs> you can do that one. You can do that one. E N T R E. Ah, you had to pause. E R E N U N E U R. That's it. Boom. That took time, though, for 20 years. So my real first one was 
bizjohn.com. B-I-Z. Bizjohn.com. <laughs> I thought it was kind of catchy. It was short, easy. It rhymes. It Biz rhymes. John. I thought it would stand out a little bit. But then I was like, you know, I really want the word entrepreneur in there for exact domain search reasons and all these other things. And I don't want it just to be about me. I want it to be about like the, the entrepreneurial community as a whole. So they started playing around with some entrepreneurial names. So I have, I still have these domains. Entrepreneur's Delight. Entrepreneur's Fantasy. That doesn't sound like... <laughs> then a business site. And then I just kind of like, we started putting words together as far as like, I want the word entrepreneur and I want like it to be like inspiring. So like entrepreneur inspire, entrepreneur inspire. And that's kind of where I came up with the word entrepreneur ignites. And I just kind of did it like that. I like, like the actual idea of the brand and like the fire and the explosions. So then literally it's just kind of just like, all of a sudden I was just like working out. I was like, entrepreneur on fire. It just makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And I went and I, you know, it's one of those like, I'm sweating. I'm like, Please go, Daddy. Please be there. Oh, it was like, it was oh, gone. So many heartbreaking moments of go, So Daddy. many heartbreaking oh, yeah. moments, right? And they're done it. And I've actually had a heartbreaking moment where I was just like, I love this name. And I just checked it. And I'm like, oh, it's there. It's awesome. And I like, went away for an hour. And I was like, That's, I should get that name. That, that name is yeah. awesome. And I loved it even more. And then I checked it and it was already taken. And I was oh. like, how did that happen? But I think I know how, how it happened. Probably. I'll tell you in a second. Um, and I was hard, then I wanted to even more. I'm like, now I really want it because I can't have it. But I really think that there's a company out there that, that can um, can track recently. Absolutely. Company, yep. Recently um, search for domains and like ones that people spend like more than a certain amount of time for, maybe get to like the last page, but just don't actually click pay now or buy. They that registers with them and then they'll snag it up because I got contacted. And I just said, hey, these domains are available, and lo and behold, one of them was that. Uh, I wanted like, you know, like 500 bucks for it or something like that. Jeez. So, there's a business. Uh, <laughs> that's shady. So, interesting question. But yeah, those are some of them. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, entrepreneur's fantasy sounds like something that you could have on the side. And you know, like these, these conventions when they're away from their families, entrepreneur fantasy could really take off. You, you could change your persona. You could be Juan Dumas or something. You know? Juanito yeah, Dumas. Yeah, yeah. Well, I had the same issue because I was Juan getting Dumas. Great ones, like, Dumas. Just, I like that. The struggle I've gone through the last two years trying to figure out how to do something online. So that was that would resonate with a lot of people. Uh, so I was trying to come up some of the journey which was taking entrepreneurs, you know, that word was so big, but people can't spell entrepreneurs, so I finally came up, I have another site, I got like 20 sites I bought, but one of the sites I just started on is called Slender Safari, which is my journey on weight loss, so I'm just oh, cool. So that's one path, which is the journey. The jungle. Yeah, it is. And it's the same thing, so I thought online income safari, it's another journey, so another word for safari is journey, so that's online income safari. I'm not out there yet, yeah, just bought the I like, you know, that's the thing, is like the word safari kind of becomes your thing. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That's exactly what I was thinking. I like it. Yeah, are you guys ready to roar, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you can do something like that. Yeah. Can't yeah, use ignite. You're be like, wait a minute, yeah. I've heard that before. Yeah. <laughs> you, can, you know, you can go to uh, get all dressed up, Tarzan right here, you shade, and, you know, take some pictures, like swinging through the jungle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This so is many, really good advice. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you make this notes. is stuff I usually try. <laughs> <laughs> Not for you guys. Not for Fire Nation. Nice. <laughs> Fire Nation. We are Did you get that from uh, Jim Rome? So, no, I got that because I went to Providence College for undergrad in Rhode Island. And okay. We are Fryer Nation. Fryer <laughs> And that so, totally makes sense. Yeah. Providence Friars. Friars. I love it. And so it just wasn't really easy for me okay. to go to Fire Nation. And I, you know, I had heard, like, you know, Davis Simon like, Garland has, like, Rise. He likes to say Rise Nation. He doesn't really pump it as much as I do. Like, I'm always saying Fire Nation. But, um,. Yeah, I just, I just liked it. That totally makes sense. Fire That's a good Nation. story. Fire, Fire Nation. Nation. Fire, yeah. Nation. Yeah. Fire Nation. I like that. And then my buddies from college always would be like, we love how much it sounds like Fire Nation. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Do you have a lot of friends and family members that listen to it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know. 
good, like I had a good baseball. That really helps. Cause like, and we'll talk, but um, have you guys seen the video that I put out? It's like a seven, oh, I sent it to you, right? Yeah, yeah he good. actually so, forwarded yeah. it to me. I hope that's all right. <laughs> oh yeah, no, no, that was for <laughs> right. people like yourself, for sure. But I mean, that is so important when you start. Like you have eight weeks to be in the new and noteworthy section, which is the best real estate in the actual store. And 99% of podcasters do not take advantage of it. Like either they just launch one podcast, they don't really promote it, then they come back a couple weeks later. But by the time they actually get around to make it happen, like they've lost like, half of their time. So for me, like I knew to really bask in that sun for as long as possible. So you got to do the podcast. Is that what made you come out with the everyday podcast? Well, was, so when I launched, I launched with like three the same day, and then for the next seven days. I, I did one every single day because you know it's, it's all download now. So like, if you only launch one in the first week, a hundred people download one. That's a hundred downloads. But if you launch five, a hundred people download that in the first week. Because everybody just clicks really you know, download all. Yeah. Not about listen to it by the way. It's just right. download. It's like the, that's a good point. That's just how you do it. It's like yeah. download all by and then you'll have five hundred downloads that first week. And iTunes looks at that as five hundred downloads, and all of a sudden you're gonna be pop right there in the um, iTunes new and old section. I mean, people are going there organically to search for podcasts, having no idea about Sun or Safari, but then they see you dressed up as Jane, and they're like, "That looks interesting." But click on it, and they'll organically find you they never would have before. It's all about the rankings. So I got to number one, and I had so many people. They would just log into iTunes and right there on your fire. They're like, well, that sounds interesting, so I just check it out. Yeah. And I got so much more gear through that in the first eight weeks. I mean, when I, and then when I dropped off in that after eight weeks, like, I saw a drop in numbers because I wasn't getting that daily organic traffic. So it's really important to build that base while you can. You get to take full advantage of it. What, what opportunity?